Well, thank you guys for showing up to the Chris Talks. It's been a little while. Last time I was here, I was up here in a Wonder Woman outfit. And so today actually marks a pretty significant day, the 21st of January. I don't know what that, that date is. It is a Chris Talk. That's very good, yeah? Five years ago, I lost my virginity. No, just <laughs> the 21st of January actually marks the date where most people will create a habit. That's what we're going to talk about tonight is habits. The average person stops their New Year's resolution when? 19th. The 19th. So how many of you guys in here have got... 13, 15, 26, 60, 65 of you in here. Uh, how many people still have a New Year's resolution going? One, two, three. Now I'm curious, just out of curiosity, a lot of people, I know I've talked to a couple of my clients, and they just don't make them because they have them year round and they're trying to constantly grow and do something. But uh, what, if you don't mind, what are you guys still going after? What is still motivating you to do yours? Mm. My friend's dad died, and like that kind of impacted me for a while. And then I was kind of like, it was bothering me that I was smoking all the time. So I decided, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop smoking, and I, I've been able to so far. Twenty one days, at least. That a boy. Before Christmas. How are you been? Are you twenty one days? You pointing at me? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I haven't smoked in twenty. Oh, nice. Good. Well, that's, that's awesome. If you don't mind sharing, what, are you still going to show on yours? Me? Yeah. Yeah. Are they like physical or are they spiritual? Or... Uh, yeah, physical. I'm trying to gain weight. Nice, nice, nice. So I was at a conference last weekend in Arizona. Not really a conference, it was a house seminar. One of my many, it sounds bad, but one of my many. Uh, man crushes. I was like, learning from Brett Contreras and the guy is very passionate about what he does and he was talking about kind of the same thing with patterns of behavior and, and when, he, when he was talking about something it kind of like clicked. I'm like that's, that's really really intelligent what he said but as my trainer told me today good people borrow amazing people steal. Right? Like that good? Oh, yeah. You're the one who said it. You used to say yes or no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what I did is I took his idea and I think I made it better. So he was talking about the transformation of going from A to Z and how most people focus so much on the small. So let's give a little example right here. I love sports. And so I'm talking about, uh, if you can't really see it, there's two teams, team one and team two. And it's a game. And so basketball games, there's four quarters and, you know, NBA stuff going right now. We have team one scoring 25 points in the first quarter, team two, 18 points. Second half, halftime score, 52 to 31. They're getting beat. Third quarter, 61-52. At the end of the game, team two ends up winning 77 to 75. What, who won the game? Not a trick question. Who won the game? Team two, as you can see. At the end of the game, they won. And so the graph may look like this. You start out here, you do well. You come down a little bit, it's flat. You come down, you go up here, come down. Well, that graph right there is very representative because that's exactly the type of graph that you're going to see with, with fat loss and weight loss, where we focus too much on the arrows. And if you see with the arrows, the arrows are at the negative portion. You know, and if you think of a basketball game, if you're down two, four points, who cares? You get back on defense, you, you work your hard, you get the ball back, you score, and you come back. So why is it that so many people focus on the negative aspect of a diet program? You know, a lot of trainers in here, and we hear all the time, our clients will come in and they'll say, I lost two pounds. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, I mean, sorry, flip that around. That's good, you lost two pounds. But if you gained two pounds, you know, who cares? We focus so much on the long term. We don't focus enough on the long term, we focus on the short term. And so if we were to switch our mindset and start thinking of it as you're at A right now, you're going to be at Z, you're going to get there. The stop in the middle doesn't really matter. It's not all a linear process. You're not going to constantly be setting one rep max on bench press. Uh, Brett and I were working out the other day. We're um, trying to increase our bench press. So can't tell. We've been doing pretty good. And uh, one of the things that, you know, this is the strongest I've ever been in my life right now. This you know, compliments to him. And we've been working out regularly. He pushes me. We're doing really, really well. But the thing that we need to understand is our bodies are different. And we were working out the other day and we were mentioned what, 600 pounds, something like that? And, uh, that was seven. Seven, okay. And it, it just didn't feel right. I was doing 295. And usually, recently, I've been able to push it a lot easier. 
but put it on there, it just didn't feel good. So I'm like, yeah, let's not do it. Let's just do something else on bench press. Let's just go down and just do some repetitions. And it's really neat when you start seeing people, I've been training a group of, of girls during the day, our booty transformation girls, and you can start seeing them kind of grasp the same idea that they, they do a lift, they don't feel well, that's fine. Cut it back, drop the weight, do work, get work done. Next time you come in, then try to set a PR. You should constantly try to push to, to be better each time, but if you're not feeling well, then listen to your body and back off. And you know, as a teacher working with a lot of students and trainers, it's, it's interesting because I have a new group coming in and everyone's all question city, questions all day long, and I have to pretend like I like them, but I don't. Uh, but you know, that there's a couple of these girls that they come in with a ton of questions, and I love it. It's great because it makes me think, it makes me be a better teacher. But I keep on challenging them back that you're not going to find one or two pages in the text that is about you. Or it's like, oh, okay, here's Christina. Okay, that's exactly how my body is going to respond. And I think that can be frustrating for some because... You know, we want an exact equation to get bigger or to get stronger or to lose fat or whatever it may be, and there's no exact equation. There's a guesstimation. Ah, eat a little less. Eat a little more. Work out harder. Work out less. Lift. Do periodization. Do something else. You know, change up the variables. But I think people get frustrated because they look at the graph and they see themselves come down. They're down by 10 points and the game's over. And that's not how it works. And, you know, it's the progression that I've been working out for, you know, 10, 15 years. And this is the strongest that I've been. I've had a lot of lows. I jacked up my back. I couldn't bench. I couldn't squat. I couldn't do anything. I could have just gave up and turned into job of the hut and not cared and drank. Well, I already drank a lot, but, you know, I'll just you know, do whatever. But, you know, you look at the long picture. And so I think that's an important thing to grasp. And, and so I'm talking about that more in my revision of my book, which I came up with these next, these next six terms for success. You guys ever heard of Napoleon Hill before? Who's Napoleon Hill? He's the guy that writes all the books you read. <laughs> <That> sounds so <laughs> great. <laughs> he is a guy that writes a lot of books that I've read. And Napoleon Hill is one of the most successful authors of all time. He wrote books back in the early 20s. His books have been around for 100 years. And it was one of the best sellers. It was Think and Grow Rich. And in his book, back in that time, they didn't cuss. You know, they were very politically correct. They say hell if a girl shows cleavage, they're going to prison. You know, so he, he wouldn't cuss very much. One of the things he talked about is a positive mindset. And the book, you probably heard of, I know Brett has The Secret, or it's about finding yourself. And, you know, that, it's, I'm just joking. But, you know, it's, uh, it's a book about The Secret, which is essentially exactly what he wrote. She stole that idea. So good, good job for her. She's being excellent. And the whole idea is just having a positive mindset. So, I, you know, my book is called The Vulgar Truth Diet, so I threw an F. What do you think the F stands for? Fuck. Fuck, there you go. So, have a positive fucking mindset. And that's really, really important before you start any type of program. You gotta believe it, you gotta see it. And I got a buddy back home, he's a freaking redneck, and <laughs> I sent him part of my little article I wrote about visualization. He's like, dude, you're turning into a hippie. <laughs> and, you know, visualization's good. You gotta think about. So you start a program, huh? Skinny hippie. <laughs> Skinny hippie. You got to think about, if you're here right now, before you even start your journey, you have to visualize it. And how many people do you think truly visualize that success? I'm not big into MMA fighting. I like watching it. But, you know, who's a badass with visualization is who? Conor McGregor. Yeah, Conor McGregor. He just came out the other day and he, did you watch that interview? His recent one? A little bit of it. The new guy that he's fighting, he's literally, didn't even let the guy talk. The whole entire time, he's just basically saying, this is what I'm going to do, blah, blah, blah. You know, getting into the mind because the mind's so powerful. So many people are weak when it comes to their own disposition. If you start something out thinking, I'm not going to succeed in this, you're not. We have a student that graduated a while ago. He's a ranger, badass. And he, he's been through the ropes. He was supposed to be here tonight. And I'm going to make him funny on purpose, Joe. That, uh, he's like, oh, I can't make it. I've got to train a client. I'm like, in other words, you have to hang out with your wife. He's like, yeah, she wanted to hang out tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so, giving you crap, Joe. But he is a badass ranger. He said that in, in basic training where they're going through ranger school, there's over 360 individuals that started. Before it even started, before they actually started doing the physical work, more than half of them quit from the stories. That's nuts. Or it's just like something like, this is freaking hard, man. You're going to fail. I'm out. See ya. <laughs> you know, people don't have the audacity to stick through it, and that's because they're not visualizing. Do you think they actually saw themselves succeeding through that camp? No, definitely not. So I haven't... Why not? Why not? You're scared, unprepared. Yeah, it's the, the fear. Yeah, everyone has that negative, we all have demons in us, and we have those voices that say you can't do it, you're stupid, you're negative. 
And it's so easy to let those take over. And when your mind allows that to take over, it's like, little, it's like a kid. When they go through school and they get a D and they come home and a parent says, you're stupid, you're going to believe you're stupid. And you tell yourself over and over and over again, then all of a sudden now you're stupid. And, and when you think that, you know, I, I'm not stupid, I can do this within reason. You know, I'm not going to be the freaking president. Get over it. <laughs> you, can, you can do whatever you want. No, you can't. You know, you know, within reason, if you want to succeed, if you want to do something, you can definitely do it. You have to imagine it, though. Visualization is really huge. Second one that I talk about is time management. And you know, going through looking at the event. Has anyone been to Europe before? You're kind of a bad example. When, when did you go to Europe? Because huh? um, you go there all the time for work. Uh, about eight years ago. And if you recall when you went, did you just buy your ticket and fly over there? Yeah. You didn't plan anything? No. Didn't plan a single thing? No. <laughs> Every single time I try to make a point, someone screws up my story. So yes, I did. Usually, when people plan a, plan a big ass trip to Europe, have you been to Europe, Tony? No. Anywhere, anywhere else? Mexico, let's see if this works. It can <laughs> so when you planned your trip to Mexico, did you just go down there and buy a ticket and just go down there and find the first resort? Or? No, we, we bought our ticket four and a half months before. You planned for it. Yeah. Probably looked at your resort, you looked at the best one that had all inclusive that all you can drink. Yeah, <laughs> boat. Uh huh, don't try to the closest hookers, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so you oh, planned right. that trip, and then when it came there, you were prepared. How many people do you think? truly do that for a weight loss strategy or a weight gain strategy. It's like, okay, I'm starting J January 1st, 2016. My goal is to be in badass shape by June 1st, which is bikini season. This is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to have some fallbacks. I'm going to hit, hit. No, we don't do that. We just jump into it and we start exercising and we start eating less. And then what do you think happens around week three or four? They fail. Adaptive thermogenesis kicks in. That's a fun term because you, you break it down. Thermogenesis is the regulation of heat. Adaptive is how a body adapts. And the body's crazy smart. It's going to adapt to the situation you put it to. And if you're not feeding your body enough, your body's going to say, hey, asshole, we need to keep the, the, the prominent, the, the important fuel, which is fat. We're going to get rid of muscle. We make the body inferior. And then we try to push harder and eat less. And then we're all jacked up. And then you have all these syndromes and stuff out there that people claim to have. And then you know, I feel sorry for people because it's, it must be hard trying to get in good shape. And I was talking to uh, my day classes, like pretty much all girls, my night classes, all guys. It's hard trying to relate to girls if you grew up all brothers. I can't relate to girls. And so I'm talking and I'm like, okay, this is my analogy with the fitness industry. It would be like me being a guy going into a big ass store that is, all, it's a department store with all this name brand stuff. And it's, you know, if your girlfriend said, hey, get me a purse, I'd be like, okay, got your purse, let's go. Or a girl, oh my god, that's not coach, you can't get that. Or it's not D and B, I don't know what the hell that means, or M and K. I thought that was Mary. Is it is that the same girl from Full House, MK? No. Michael Kors. Oh, that was Mary Kate. <laughs> <laughs> See? I wouldn't have known. I would have gotten in big time trouble. I'm getting uh, Michael Kors. But imagine a guy going in there and trying to get something. The average guy probably wouldn't be able to get something that is I mean, maybe I'm just wrong, I'm just a heck or whatever, but I would say that the average girl probably will get it. So imagine the average consumer is trying to get in good shape. Where do you think they go? They go online, they type in Costco. how to lose weight. <laughs> and then all this crap comes up, and how can you filter what's good, what's bad? A lot of times you type in how to get ripped, you got this big ass Asian dude who's shredded. You guys seen him on YouTube? Yeah. Said all over the place. Where does this guy come from? 75, you know, 7.5 million followers. I don't know who the hell he is, but he's just all jacked up and that's the person giving you advice. It must be tough because that's you're not going to get the results following his plan because he doesn't have an organized approach. So something I talk about in my book is winning the week, kind of going off of that uh, basketball analogy. In the in the game, you may be down a quarter, you may be down a half, even three quarters. It doesn't matter as long as you win the game. But if you don't win that game, who cares? You have seven games. If you lose four, you're screwed. You lost. But there's seven days in a week. If you work out Monday, you work out Wednesday, you work out Friday, and you work out one day on the weekend, you've worked out four times, you've won the week. You're setting yourself up for success. If you don't, just think of it as you had a little drop. Who cares? You had a little drop. Get back into your program. Get back into your routine. And you're going to be fine. Because at the end of the year, January, uh, December 31st, you're going to be where you want to be. And you're going to have that body, whatever your specific goal is. Fix your spine. So I love talking about sex, sleep, stress, psychology, injuries, nutrition, and exercise. This is kind of like the psychological aspect where 
Uh, you get into the aspect of uh, working on patterns. And patterns are so common today where, you know, just think of yourself today when you woke up. I'll be willing to bet who's a snoozer. You know, we got a couple of snoozers. You probably snooze consistently the same amount of times. And then when you do wake up, you have your rituals. You go in the shower. You wash yourself the same exact way. You do something else. And then, you, you know, whatever your routine is, you wash yourself, you brush your teeth. When was the last time you changed up those patterns? I challenge you to try to brush your teeth with the opposite hand. When you go in your car today, if you're not drinking, put your seatbelt on the opposite side. If you grab your credit card to give to someone, do it the opposite side. It's little things like that, we get in these patterns and the brain gets used to it. And that's almost like those negative voices that are just allowing for comfort. When you succeed, and you know, Hill talks about this, and The Secret talks about this, and I talk about that, you're going to break those patterns, you're going to consistently conquer those negative voices. And then we have showing up, which is the hardest part right there. What does the wall say? Not that wall, that wall. 90% of success is showing up. And that's so true. I mean, I look at the six years of me being a teacher and, you know, trainers that are here that you know, train for show-up fitness, those are the ones that consistently were in class. I've never hired a trainer for show-up fitness that wasn't there 90 plus percent of the time. I can't think about it. You were gone for a week because school started and you didn't even know about it or something like that. That was the longest you missed. So it's like you know, the majority of good trainers that have gone through my program, they were there regularly. You're a good example. You train regularly. You show up. You're drunk half the time, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're consistent about it. <laughs> think about people, you too, but think about people who you know who are successful. And are they regularly managing their time? Are they positive? Are they winning the week? Are they exercising? They have those things in the line. And then uh, last but not least, which I always profess, which is uh, being human. And so... Being human is drinking, having fun, be doing what you like, but not caring if you, you have a setback. If you like to drink, drink, work out, win the week, and show up, be human. That's, that's what I like. You guys have any questions? Joey. Uh, you mentioned routines, and I actually saw a recent TED Talk that I thought was interesting, and I actually tried it a couple years ago when I was a little bit more religious about morning workouts. What are your thoughts on cold showers in the morning? They say a good five minute shower just wakes you up. It's good for effort like shifting or numbing muscles, whatever it is. I mean, what are your thoughts on it? I always ask why you're doing it. So the average person, I mean, who in here can wake up and take a freezing cold shower? No. 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 Who would want to try it? No. Yeah. Maybe. You want to try it? Yeah. <laughs> Give it a shot. I, I remember there was this. Um, Side tangent, but there's this cougar I was dating for a little bit, and she had this pool, and this was in Lodi. And every morning I'd wake up, I would go jump in her pool, and it was freezing. I'd wake up, and I'd just be like, Whew, I'd be ready to go. Something psychologically, I hated that jump, but when I was in the water and I came out, it kind of revived me. So I see that psychological thing that can get you definitely going. The science behind it is going to be more the patterning of changing your patterns and really just strengthening your mind. It's not going to be anything like physiologic that's going to be beneficial. A lot of that cold immersion therapy is big right now where people think that it's going to help with your tissues and all this stuff. And that's not, uh, you know, icing, if you have an injury, icing doesn't do shit. It's, it's definitely uh, old school thought. It was in the 80s. Even the funny thing is it's called uh, crinotherapy. And the guy who, the doctor who originally came up with the study about this is awesome, he came out like three years ago like, ah, shit, sorry guys, uh, last three years, actually it was false. <laughs> and he was just like, hey, at least you had the balls to come out and say, oh, in the last three years of my life that I've dedicated my work to, it's false. But, you know, icing is great if you have an injury and you just want it to be numb, you don't want to feel it. Hey, if you hurt your ankle, it hurts like hell, put your foot in freezing cold water, it's going to take the pain away, but it's not going to do it. It's actually going to um, slow the healing process. The body's natural response is going to allow the lymphatic system to go down there, clean it out with these certain cells, phagocytes, and when you lock down that area, you don't allow the lymphatic fluid to get down there to clean it up. So essentially, you're slowing down the natural process. A lot of athletes at the higher elite level, they do it, and imagine, just put yourself in that shit, that's how cool the mind is. Imagine if you're an athlete and the strength coach says, get into that cold bath, it's going to help you feel better. Coach, you know, what's the science behind it? I work with Michael Jordan, work with him, get your ass in there. Simple so, yeah, it's called, some people call it the nocebo. 
where it's like they'll even put that in there saying it's it's going to work or maybe it's not going to work. And so you chip you trick the mind. But the, the science behind it is pretty weak. And so I, if, have you tried it? Uh, yeah, I did the cold showers for like three months. Huh? Um, yeah, like to your point. Honestly, it gets a lot smaller, huh? Really <laughs> 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 uh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's mean, some ways I did get used to it, but then, I mean, I think it was psychological. Like, it was around the time that I stopped doing my morning workouts, and I stopped doing that, too. Mm -hmm. I'm like, fuck that, I'm not doing it again, so. So imagine if you were to set your mind up for success in the sense that change that behavior, the pattern of getting in the shower and do something else. Yeah. Try to do that. I always thought that was... Uh, Admirable in what was it, Batman one, the one with uh, uh Va not Val Kilmer, the Kate. no, the recent one, Bale, Bale. 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 Christian Bale, yeah. Bale. Bale. where remember he gets his ass kicked by a bunch of dogs and he gets up and he's just like, uh, he falls down and starts doing push ups. Wow. You know, that's his pattern in the morning that you're doing, and, and you can create those patterns. You know, I've uh, when, once I heard Eric Cressy, he's a famous strength coach who works with baseball players. Um, she was like, right on my birthday, June 16th, he did this post about how many books he's read in June. It started since the beginning of the year, which is five and a half months, and he's like, I've done 50 books. I'm like, 50 books? What the hell do you do? And he's managing two gyms, very, very large gym. This is a small gym. You know, tons of people going through his, his, his body. He's driving back and forth. He just had twins. And he's reading 50 books in five months. I'm like, damn, I'm being a big pussy right now. I got I to gotta show up. I got to start doing this. So I started waking up at 5 o'clock. I, I thought I was being... Talk about we have a six. I just pushed it back to five. It sucked first couple of weeks, but then I got into a routine and now I do it regularly. And it's, it's no big deal. I just wake up and say, like, Okay, yeah. well, maybe I'm over, but let's go. <laughs> Did you have a question, Tom? No, right there. Yeah, so adaptive thermogenesis is when your body uh, starts to break to, like muscle tissue down. It's not that it necessarily breaks it down, it, to store, it, it store begins back? to be more economical. So when the body takes a pulse, and right now it's saying, okay, my heart's beating fast, it's cold, I'm hot, whatever. It has all these checks and balances that it's doing. And if there's been a state, a prolonged state, it's going to be genetics, it's going to be how long you've been doing it for, of a couple weeks, and you've been truly starving yourself. Does anyone know what the average American consumes calorie-wise? A day. Hmm? 2,000? 2,100? 2,700, of which... 30 years ago, we were consuming 2,100. We're not moving as much, and so you put this equation together, plus 500 calories from food intake, and minus 200 calories, because we're not moving as much. So on average, we're putting in an extra 700 calories. It's not, it's, it's gonna add weight, it's that, that's it, that simple. And so if you're gonna go on a diet, the average diet today, if you look at plans, what do they suggest? 1,200 1, calories. And so you have 2,700, 1,200. You're feasting up here, and then you continue to do this. What happened is your body's saying, oh, shit, this is famine. So we need to get rid of muscle. We need to store our fat. Fat's going to now be stored. That's when you get the, your fat face, your little fat belly, and everything stored right there because that's the body's natural mechanism. And then you're releasing a boatload more cortisol. It's going to be higher at night. You're not going to sleep as well. You're going to wake up with low cortisol. Everything sucks. And if you wake up in the morning and you have low energy, what does the average person do? Go back to sleep. If you have work, you have coffee. Yeah. Nothing wrong with coffee. Coffee is amazing. But it's like the example of porridge where Goldilocks, you guys remember that little hooker? She was trying to steal people's stuff where she wanted the cold, she wanted the hot. What does she want? She wanted the middle. That's what cortisol is. It's great in the middle, but when it's too much, it's bad for you. And so same with cortisol. When you are in the state of constant stress, you wake up and then you have coffee and you get in your car. Who drives the furthest here? I mean, like, location-wise, who drives? I know it's, we don't have to drive anymore. <laughs> so maybe 30 minutes, an hour, mm -hmm. you're stuck in traffic. What does the average person do? <laughs> They're pissed off. And so then the cortisol levels go up. You come to work, you hit your boss. Your boss is calling you an asshole all day, so then afterwards you go and drink. And you got all this nasty snowball effect of all this stuff. And people want to land base cortisol. It's a bad hormone. It's, it's the environment that sucks. You need to change the behavior and the pattern that work or no? Well, yeah, no, my qu I didn't finish my question. My question was, so when you intermittent fast, mm -hmm. are you in a state of adaptive thermogenesis? So they say it's a prolonged state. So, that's so the, a, a body likes a little bit of a curveball. And so if you were to you know, not eat for a day, I highly encourage it. Your body actually kind of likes it. It's like, oh, I haven't had food today. I'm going to adapt a little bit, but the next day you eat. That's usually how I, how I myself eat. I'll do five days of consistency with a hyper and a hypochloric day. 
hypercaloric day is going to be you know, a lot of alcohol and a lot of Carl's Jr. at 2 a.m. And then maybe a day or two later, I might have 500 calories. I'm not going to eat that much. I'm not going to burn off my muscle from one day of being in the state. And, and so adaptive thermogenesis is going to take place longer. So it could be four weeks, could be six weeks. Genetics, your stress levels. If you, I had this girl that I was prepping for a show, and we had her on a, a pretty low caloric intake. It was fine, it was manageable, but the thing that she wasn't telling me about, she wasn't sleeping a lot, and I didn't even know at the time that her mom was going through chemo. After she told me this, I'm like, that might have been helpful, <laughs> because you think there might be a little bit of stress if your mom's going through chemo? Yeah, so she got into the state pretty quickly, because the equation was just not right for her. Oh, um, I remember the videos that you had with your dad. Where he was like on the Which floor. Which videos? Yeah. <laughs> you didn't want to see those on ones. One time he's on the floor and you're like teaching him to try and get up a different way or like mm -hmm. his eyes closed or something. That mm -hmm. was kind of like what you were talking about with the patterns. Yeah. And does that form new like neural pathways yeah. or something? Mm -hmm. Definitely. So one, you're releasing a cool hormone called no, uh, protein called BDNF, brain derived neurotropic factor. And what that does is it helps with neuroplasticity where I... Bet you a million dollars, you get out of bed the same exact way. Especially if you're sleeping with someone, you're going to roll to the left, get out of bed. If you land on the ground, you're going to roll up to your left, get up. You're, if you're in the bathroom, you're going to shake three times, move to the left. <laughs> you do the same thing over and over again. And so when you challenge that pattern, you're creating good pathways. And so what I had him do is I had him lie down. My dad's 73 years old. I said, get up, Pops. And he got up, and I'm like, how did you get up? And he's like, uh, I'm like, sit back down and go through it step by step. And he turned to his right, and got up, pressed, and got up. And I said, okay, you went to your right side. Now I want you to come back down, and I want you to go to the left side. And so when he came up, it was really interesting because the natural way, just fluid, like a ninja. Second side, it was like this. Huge delay. And he's like, I actually have to turn to my left. I need to go to my left. But he kept on going to his right. His brain's like, go, to your, go this way because that's what you're used to. And then he starts breaking that pattern. And so that patterning and that recognition is really important, especially as we get older, because if the mind's complacent, it's just going to get a lot of placky. And then you're essentially just going to roll over and die. So <laughs> and that's why they talk about, you know, you know, that's true. I mean, that's why they talk about Sudoku and all that stuff, it's good for the mind, you know, and, and challenging it. Because if you, if you don't work on those fine motor skills, they're just going to go away. Should you carry that over into your like set up for your squats and your deadlifts, or is that important to have your rituals? And that's a, that's a little different. You're getting into like a psychological stuff, and that's, you know, you know, sports teams today actually have, part of their sports team is a psychological coach, where they work with people, in the, you know, how common is it to see guys in the playoffs, baseball, and they have white shit on the bottom of their hat, and their hats are just jacked up. Why are their hats all nasty? What's the white shit? Salt. <laughs> oh, why do most baseball players... You know what I'm talking about? Have those what? No, like you see those baseball players that go through the the ritual of not cleaning their stuff. Yeah, they don't change their hat. Yeah, why? Superstitious. Superstitious. And so it's going to the placebo effect. But imagine <laughs> going through and cleaning one of their hats, and all of a sudden the, the team loses. You're like, oh, shit. Uh, my, <laughs> my family still gives me crap today about the superstitious thing. And, Sorry, Grandpa, but my grandpa would always take shots of this whiskey uh, shot glass, and he literally did it for like 10 years and never washed it. And, it, and I was like 13, and, and I was like, it's disgusting. He'd always give me shots when I was younger. And he wasn't, huh? <laughs> yeah. I was a little ritual. And Dad's like, yeah, you have a shot with Grandpa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'd have a shot, and then as I get older, I was like, that's really disgusting. Everyone's like, no, don't wash it. You can't do it. It's superstitious. I'm like, no, it's not. I washed the glass, and two days later, Grandpa died. No. No, you're joking. No, I swear to God. And everyone's like, you killed Grandpa. I'm like, I didn't mean it. was dirty. I that out. <laughs> so I was like, oh, my God. Did it really kill him? No, I didn't kill him. <laughs> no, but people, you imagine the mindset of a baseball player. It's like, you just washed my special hat. You know, that's, I won the last 13 games in a row. If you know who Justin Verlander is, he has the same exact meal from Taco Bell every single time he pitches. He has like a number 10 or something like that. If he doesn't get it, he throws a fit because that's his ritual. So that's a little different aspect when oh, you get okay. into that. Where the pattern is good when it comes to everyday things, but superstition... So there's a difference between autopilot and superstition. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. So number 10 in the side of kid up there, right? <laughs> Tough one. <laughs> you get 20 million a year? Extra sauce? 
Any other questions? I always love the questions. They, they take it off. <laughs> you really don't know? Oh yeah, you do. You learn. <laughs> okay. So, are there any things that you can do, or like eat, or something that can help just lower your cortisol levels if you might have high ones? Great question. So, I think that's another problem that our society has. A lot of our clients start working out, and they're not exercising regularly. They're not one in the week. Their nutrition's all jacked up. And a lot of our clients, the first week, they say, I want supplements. Give me creates and give me BCAAs. I heard about this thing called L-arginine. This is supposed to be awesome. What about this? They want all those supplements. But when you look at there's a really cool pyramid that this uh, sports scientist made. And he looks at the top, and it's like this big. He says, that's the impact of uh, supplements. This is the stuff that's going to really make the impact. If you're, I can give you everything under the sun and things that are going to help you sleep better, but if you're not sleeping six, seven, and seven plus hours a night, you're screwed. Dr. Parsley is a, a big sleep doctor, and the equivalent of sleeping six and a half hours a night is walking around during the day with a .05 blood alcohol content. That's nuts. That's two and a half drinks. That's usually what I have every day. But uh, you know, that's it's pretty nuts to think about. You're constantly at that level because you're not sleeping. Why am I trying to fix small things if you can't even cope with your stress? Work with your sleep. Go see a freaking shrink. Work on listening to birds, shit, whatever makes you <laughs> calm down. But you need to relax. Cortisol levels could be high. There's a lot of uh, Eastern stuff that people will suggest, and you're familiar with a lot of them. Uh, the, the certain teas, great, but maybe go back to the bigger thing. Maybe there's a bigger gorilla in your closet that you need to address. Yeah. So why, why, other than a negative aspect of cortisol being produced, is there any positive in cortisol? Yeah, definitely. It's an anti-inflammatory. It helps with the body healing process. It breaks down fat. Yeah. Its main job is to break down fat. Yeah. Yeah. When you release it, it's, it's a catecholamine. So when your adrenals release it, it goes, oh, let's break down fat. It's a freaking party. It's awesome. An example I give in my book, <laughs> I, I laugh at myself a lot. I think I'm very funny, but I'm really not. I, I talk about a, a gardener at your, at your house. <laughs> And when you give your gardener duties to do, it's going to do them. But when the husband leaves, if you don't give the gardener enough duties, he's going to end up sleeping with your wife. <laughs> See, isn't that kind of funny? You know, no, that's how that's not doing. So if you don't give the, you know, the, the, the pool boy enough stuff to do, he's going to get bored. And next thing he's going to start doing your wife. And so that's the analogy I give. That's the cortisol. And you, you come home at the right time, your house looks amazing. Let it go a little past that, all of a sudden, blue boy's stuff in the wife, so you want to be careful about that. Cortisol's a great home. You can't knock it. If you, have, if you don't have enough, you can get a Cushing's in disease, which is deadly. And if you use, use what you produce. Yeah, exactly. But then you can get to the point where it's extreme, and you have people who have, uh, I hate this word, uh, adrenal fatigue, because it's like you read about it, oh, I have that, I have that. You don't have that. You don't work out. You don't do shit. You know. Oh, I, I, I overtrain. No, you don't. You don't overtrain. You're fine. Work out. Stop being a pussy. You know, people, you know, we always want to look for some type of scapegoat that can allow us to be just to be comfortable. I want to be inferior. There's nothing wrong with that. Man. There is. It's like people don't want to just you know, show up and, and kick ass. Anything else? Ramble on the last couple of questions. Trying to get a buzz now. All right, let's call it. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Sunday. Hydrants. Pats. Yep.